I'm David Baker, and I'm so glad you came tonight to hear the work of three of our poetry neighbors, Michael Rosen, Maggie Smith, and Kathy Fagan, each of whom brings a brand new, wonderful book of poetry. It's also the very beginning of National Poetry Month, so we have all kinds of things to celebrate. It's also National Sports Eye Injury Awareness Month. <laughs> It is National Florida Tomato Month. It is Kite Month. It is Frog Month. It is Straw Hat Month, Pecan Month. It is, boys and girls, National Holy Humor Month. I looked them up. This is how many months April is. Yeah, just makes you kind of crazy, doesn't it? Competition. We will hear from Kathy first, then Michael, then Maggie. I should tell you, all three poets are very dear friends. When I moved myself to Central Ohio in 1984, one of the first people I sought out was Michael Rosen. I had just seen a poem of his about a rainbow trout in The New Yorker, and I thought, I should find this guy. We are going to be neighbors. I'd already met Kathy Fagan when she moved to Salt Lake City in about 1981 or two or three, two I think, two, where I was doing my PhD and where she started in that same program. Maggie Smith is my newest friend and our friendship dates back to 2005 when we met in the MFA program for writers at Ohio State where Maggie was finishing up her degree and where I was teaching. So Kathy first. Kathy moved to Utah, um, to Ohio, I should say, after finishing her PhD, moved to California to teach, and then here to Central Ohio in 1989, where she's currently director of the MFA program at Ohio State, where she is poetry editor for the OSU Press and advisor to OSU's literary magazine, The Journal. She's published five award-winning books of poems, including her brand new book, Sycamore, from Milkweed Editions, which is a finalist for the Kingsley Tufts Poetry Prize and the William Carlos Williams Award. You will hear a wonderful lyric depth in Fagan's work, a blend of devotion and anxiety to the forms and methods of poetic singing. Her poems are rich, complex, powerfully moving. You'll see. Michael Rosen, my fish poem buddy, was born in Columbus, educated there in New York City, where he took his MFA from Columbia. He did a stint in animal behavior in school, a stint in med school, and has long been a devoted animal rights person. I think his email is something like Fido philosopher or something. Fido. Yeah, that's just pathetic. That's... <laughs> For years, Michael served as director. He was one of the creators of the wonderful Thurber House in Columbus. But about 20 years ago or so, 15 years ago, he moved into the wilderness of rural Ohio. He lives on 100 acres outside of Glenford now with dogs and flowers and trees and where he makes his living writing books and sometimes illustrating his books for children and young writers, as well as poetry for adults. At latest count, are you ready? Really, get ready for this. Michael has published something over 150 books. <laughs> <laughs> this, my friends, is an actual professional writer. I've never met one before who makes a living writing books. Michael's newest book of poems is Every Species of Hope, and we're here to celebrate that book. We'll end the reading with Maggie Smith, also a Columbus native. Maggie took her degree in English 
No, it wasn't English. What did you get your degree in? Creative writing. Creative writing. Okay, close. <laughs> From Ohio Wesleyan, and then did her MFA at Ohio State, and now lives in Bexley. She's worked in children's literature, too, as an editor at a children's trade book company before she decided to turn to freelance work, which she continues now. Maggie's published three chapbooks and three full-length volumes of poetry, including the brand new Good Bones. You might know that title. An incredible thing happened to Maggie a year or two ago. A new poem of hers, called Good Bones, appeared in an online literary journal called Waxwing. That's news enough for a poet. And the most we hope for, someone reads our poem. Maybe a few hundred. Maybe a couple of thousand if we really hit the big time. But Maggie's poem went as they say, as though it were an illness, viral, in a matter of days, thousands, tens of thousands. And now, who knows how many people have read and shared and tweeted and Instagrammed and blogged about this timely, funny, heartbreaking poem. You'll see. And you'll hear that great combination of heartbreak and humor of familiarity and familial in Maggie's work tonight. This is a real treat this evening. We have cookies and <laughs> books and poems, and we'll start with my dear friend, Kathy Fagan. It's so lovely to be back at Denison um, again, especially with you all and Anne, um, David, Mike, Mags, Michael, um, as David mentioned, we're friends. We're all friends. Um, and I thank uh, David and Anne especially for the invitation. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to read three poems from Sycamore to start us off. Um, this book, um, just by way of introduction, is about one very brutal winter um, and a very hard loss. Um, using the sycamore tree as a figure on which to focus attention helped me to cope um, with my grief, and writing the poems gave me a vocabulary for it. So how things get named and how strange human language is, is one obsession here. And I think that you'll hear that in all the poems, but especially in this first poem, which also begins the book, and it's called Caro Nome, which is Italian for dearest or most precious name. Can everybody hear me okay? Even if I put my head down a little bit, you can hear me? Okay. Jets shake the air, and snow breaks off a tree branch in little puffs. One cardinal, cars moving slowly downhill on the ice. It's always someone's last day. Dearest bird, she read from the card she'd found unattached to the flowers. Happy day to our sweetest heart, love, monster, and beef dad. Their secret language. Manashevitz, she calls me for the sweetness. Manitoba, for the expanse. Deer rest in snow, charcoal muzzle to charcoal hoof, heads slung over their shoulders like swans. One is in REM. Look at it dreaming, she said. Fern buttons unwheel in a dark place behind the snow, a contrast she loves in me. The sledding hill is closed. The days like an unused billboard, but sunsets have been fantastic, jewel-toned as the flowers unattached to the card, or hot like the cardinal who pins the whole picture up with your eye. Meanwhile, her tree is an iron room with the moon inside. Its branches have a mental disorder, so sunsets keep dodging them. I am the color of that tree she loves, and nearly as still. And my blood, which is not in this picture, will soon cool. Sunset winking out in my eyes, and her eyes welling in a language that once fell and rose in drifts, then melted. Starry, she said. Starry into my warm coat.
So spring does arrive at the end, end of winter. Um, it does. <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> Doesn't it? Please assure me that spring will arrive. It did in this book, anyway. Um, and toward the end of this book, um, I have this poem called Perpendicular. It would have been a fine path for a lizard to cross, but I saw none. Brambles and sweetbriar grew on the town side, poppies and wild grasses on the river. Too hot for birds, the ducks were out in water in, and mud, and frogs were out by the hundreds, it seemed, saying way, way in their deepest voices. It was beautiful there, but I'd seen beauty and its opposite so often that when warmth broke over my skin, I remembered winter, the way fresh grief undoes you the moment you're fully awake. I asked my young friend when she turned two what she would serve at her birthday party, and she said tofu and cupcakes. When she was three and I was very sad, she called and said, what are you doing, picking flowers? She talked in poems like she was dreaming all the time or very old or Virginia Woolf. <laughs> More often in the first world, one wakes from, not to the nightmare. When I dreamed I lost my love, I willed myself awake because I would not survive the pain again, even dreaming. Which is responsible for that mercy doctor? The conscious or the un? I want the poppies picked, and I want the poppies left where they grow. Like looking through the window of a moving train at someone walking up a road lined with poplars and being someone walking up a road lined with poplars. The train and the trees, a shower of petals and bees, sun on the glass and the train perpendicular to the road, things entirely themselves, arriving in the deep double shadows of the grass and passers-by. Um, this last poem that I'll read you from Sycamore is called Inscription, and it's the penultimate poem um, in the book. And you might need to know um, just three quick things about it. Um, first, the subtitle is Canal de Midi, France, which is a canal built in the 17th century for um, shipping purposes. Second, the plane tree and the sycamore tree are basically the same trees. Um, and third, there's a tiny bit of French and franglais um, in this poem. Um, in particular, the word sex toys, um, which is spelled S-E-X-E-T-O-Y-E-S. -E -E Vive la France, what can I say? <laughs> Inscription, Canal de Midi, France. Arcades of plane trees arc aves above the canal. I know they are not a choir. I know they are not kabuki, tusk, knuckle, or the swords and flames St. Joan rode into, though it's true, I think of them as these. And as the sky's deep pockets of snow, white keys, mammoth teeth, it is my way and my need, mes amours, sycamore, my emblems on a crest, gallery of visible ghosts. Mostly, I love the light they hold inside, the all too much and aged toujours of them, their airborne electricities. Who's to explain affinities like these? Two seas were joined this way in 1681, sparing sailors from piracy and storms. In the 1830s, planes were planted on its banks to protect vacationers from sun. Now a careless tourist nicks a tree with rope and spreads disease that will kill them all. Ceratocystis platini, traced to munitions boxes brought by World War II GIs. 42,000 must be felled and burned to save scientists hope the remaining planes, cousin to our sycamore, that is the wood that made the box that held the fungus riding in the waters of the canal. Measures have been taken, the road to hell, etc. St. Joan finally was burned to death for the cross dressing. 
kabuki theaters incinerated by soldiers for their drag shows and wartime sympathies. Sorrow, desire. There are so many auto fatalities on plain lined streets here. The French joke about why the tree crossed the road. They burn the hollows out sometimes. Inscribe vaginal lips around the gashes in swaths of hot pink paint. What we leave behind and what is left of us are related questions. The graves in town are up to three centuries old. Some crypts, forged crosses, chipped wreaths of ceramic flowers, earth gouged, trees felled, buildings raised, never mind the lives. In the new world, a fungus-resistant sycamore is bred to replace relatives destroyed at the canal. Measures taken, like swapping out the burnt-out bulbs on a string of Christmas lights. So what if we are replaceable? Mostly, I love how we burst the prisons of our skins and shine. Outside the cemetery, someone's magic markered a locked electrical box with the words, sex toys. The plaques on the graves nearby are inscribed souvenir and regret, which are, even in my language, polite ways of saying done. So some new poems now. Um, I've been reading from Sycamore for about a year, and I'm so eager to read some new poems and try them out on you. So thanks for being pati patient with me. I um, lost my mom last year, and for nearly five years now, my dad, who's deaf and dementing, um, has lived with my husband and me. Um, so my work is thinking, I think, more overtly than ever before about where we come from and um, why we're here at all. This first poem is called Mint. I asked my students, did we still use the term skirt chaser? And they all said no, looking a little sorry for me. <laughs> no to coins in the parking meters, which now accept credit. So no to hoarding change in the hard plastic well near the handbrake and God knows what. No to religious statues for as long as anyone can remember. No to magnets, yes to air fresheners, and yes to the new bobbleheads, which are much like the old bobbleheads, only less offensive. <laughs> it's never all about change, is it? Just mostly, especially in poetry. Always a nickel dulling in the powdered soap of those days. Someone seated in a webbed folding chair with a house coat on. There in the open door of the garage or breezeway, the tenement, hospital or candy store, or there on the stoop or stairs, on the porch or in the window. Still so many women in doorways and windows the world over, their time as mothers or mothers to no one long past, and having neither will nor strength to pull up hose, zip a skirt, or button a blouse with stiff fingers, they do not wave when you wave and why, in heaven's name, they might say, would they? Women in house coats or house dresses, women in scuffed slippers like school uniforms, aging women as the new tattoo, which is why I could never have one. What would I choose for this body with its changing skins, its tits and its hips and its two pink mouths, its hands, a threshold of so often idle and digging for something or waving and waving, then closing the door. There's a, uh, also a tiny bit of French in these next two poems, but I think they're, it's fairly clear. This is called Forest. When I found the tick, I forgot the rules I'd read. With thumb and forefinger, I severed its body from mine, just wanting it out of me, as I've heard people say of babies and cancers. I felt a mix of tenderness and disgust for it then, like the twin streams of blood and water rinsing down the drain. That summer, I used English only to write poems and speak with my lover, yet the French insisted on speaking English to me. 
You visit Foret, asked the pharmacist in charge of medical emergencies like mine. I heard F-O-R-A-Y, Foray, in a Foret. Non, I said, jamais. Not far from there, pears grow in bottles, suspended from the trees to make a potent digestif. As long as the fruit remains submerged in the liqueur, the pear keeps whole indefinitely. When my mother locked me out, I was two and three. I'd go to our willow tree, wrap myself in its whips, stroke its many sharp eyebrows with my hands. The pharmacist asked me to remove my tights to see where the tick had lodged, not far from my crotch. Exposed like that, I thought I should feel more embarrassed than I did. I used to believe I had been preserved by something. Now I think I am the preserving spirit. With my leafy fragrance, sound of wings in the canopy, blood draining swiftly from the head as I look up, neither host nor guest, exile, speaking for one reason only, and the reason is love. This is called Animal Prudence. Hi. Mice drink the rainwater before dying by the poison we set in the cupboard for them. They come for the bird seed, and winter is so gray here, the sight of a single cardinal can keep us warm for days. We'll justify anything, and by we, I mean I, and by I, I mean we, with our man is the only animal who, and our manifest destiny, killers each of us by greater or lesser degrees. Instead of a gun or knife in my pocket, there are two notes on which the dandelion reads one. I don't know what it means, but cannot throw it away. It is soft as cashmere. The other says coffee, chocolate, birdseed. I should be extinct by now, except I can't make it onto that list either. Like toothpicks made of plain wood, some things are increasingly hard to find. Even when he was a young drunk going deaf from target practice, my father preferred picking his teeth to brushing them. My mother preferred crying. They bought or rented places on streets named Castle, Ring, Greystone, as if we were heroes in a Celtic epic. <laughs> Our romanticism was earned and leaned toward the Gothic, but lichen aimed for names on gravestones far lovelier than our own. It seemed to last a long time, that long time ago. Finches pixelating the hurricane fences, cars idling exhaust, dandelions bolting from flower to weed, to delicacy, like me. Egyptians prepared their dead for a difficult journey. Living is more, I was going to say more difficult, but more alone will do. Imprudent, like art, always falling below or rising above the Aristotelian mean. In France, a common rural road sign reads, animal, Prudence, purely cautionary, it has nothing to do with Aristotle, but offers sound advice nonetheless. These days, I caution my father more than he ever cautioned me. He hears his oral hallucinations better and shows greater interest, sports casters at ball games, revelers at the parties he insists on. He's got all his own teeth, so toothpicks must do the job. His pockets fill with them. There are always half a dozen rattling like desert bones in my dryer. I think of the mason who chiseled his face in the cathedral wall. He couldn't write his name. The yellow bouquets I'd offer my mother by the fistful also got their name in France. Dante de Lyon, meaning teeth of the lion. This last poem makes reference to song dedications on the radio. Is that still a thing? 
Do people still dedicate songs? Okay. Sort of? No? Half the audience says yes. What? Dep depends on the station. Okay. Um, and specifically to a Sonny and Ch well, Sonny and Cher's most famous song um, in particular. I'll make you wait for it. Um, thanks again for coming out. Um, I can't wait to hear Michael and Maggie. Um, and thank you for being here tonight. Dedicated. The way I remember it, I caught beauty like a flu via handshake or high five or a thank you for your service between the guys at the VA. The one who lurched toward me, touching me, saying, you like poetry, more vision than question. The one who said, overhearing me correct my Korean conflict era dad, go easy, you won't have him long. Or the one who said, you watch him like a hawk, just let him go. In the molecular biology lab, each tank full of impossibly small fish bears a sign that says, you are responsible for your own deads. Plural, sure. The older I get, the more I am reminded of song dedications on the radio. I called cousin Brucie to send out I've Got You Babe to my parents on their wedding anniversary. When he played them Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves, Bob and Marianne were understandably confused, <laughs> but appreciative nonetheless. I myself have had three partners in my lifetime, and what I still love best about two of them is how I never had to explain that joke. There was all that time listening to radio or TV. TV turned internet. I wish I could dedicate those spent hours now to my mom so she could come back a while. She wouldn't have to know she was dead. Like we didn't know then how much time was passing. I would play with her hair like I used to and tell her stories until she began to doze off like she used to, waking only to say, I didn't ever know you loved me, Kath. You never wanted affection from us, Kath. Just like she used to. The wrong song, somehow the right song, playing on and on like a perfect virus. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the last time I think I got to read with Maggie and Kathy was for Writers Resist. And to me, it, being welcomed here so generously, I realized that, you know, every time you write poetry, you are resisting. That it is an act of resistance in every way. In the choice of words you choose, you resist what's common, what comes first. Uh, in writing poetry, you resist going on. You are not writing prose. You are not continuing. You are resisting such motion. And perhaps most profoundly, you are resisting being anyone but your own particular voice. You have, if you are succeeding, no choice but to be the nuanced reaction that you are to whatever it is you elect to be uh, your subject at the moment. So um, I want to begin by just applauding the fact that at least something in this room, ineffable though it may be, is the spirit of resistance and that we have come together to recognize that. Um, I'm going to read from Every Species of Hope. Most of the book uh, consists of Georgic's poems of pastoral instruction, although rather than presume to give any sort of instruction, I'm receiving it, even though I'm yet the author. Um, this first poem is called On Spinning. And uh, just to remember who Arachne and Athena were, the goddess of uh, crafts and so forth, was challenged by this earthly weaver that she could spin something so much more lovely. They had a contest. Um, the earthling, as it were, uh, lost. And so uh, she was clubbed on the head three times, her hair fell out, her nose fell off, her 
fingers became attached to her side. She turned into a spider and was forever tasked with the idea of spinning. And for your zoology uh, class, you might remember a homologue is when one species or creature or file taxa shares a common, um, a common trait like bat wings, dolphin flippers, dog legs. On spinning, a lifeline trails each move a spider makes, weaving mullions from which it spies the universe. Imagine if humans too could see the rambling course we've roamed in search of sustenance and love. What if, like arachnids, we could retrace the tenuous lines we've left, repair or even consume the past and twist it into another future? As for what we spin, hope may be the closest homologue. Yet nothing we make, nothing on earth can match the spider's strands for strength. Already men and women of science are tasked with harnessing the spider's skill for uses once thought wild but now fall well within the powers of imagination. A silk for bulletproofing clothes for hulls of jets, for patching valves inside a failing heart. This question is not unlike the one Arachne must have considered pitting the art of her loom against Athena, oblivious to triumph's aftermath, to what is left a soul that humbles God. Arachne hanged herself in the forest, and to this day each, each path you clear still bears witness to her handiwork, invisible as guilt or fear or any consequence of choice, until a web snaps across your face and you lurch backwards, plucking the gauze that clings with shells and legs and wings of other victims on your skin. So far, the spiders will not cooperate. In any factory that's built for them, the brutes devour one another before they could submit to the diabolical labor of another race. Now we must ask ourselves, will anything escape the force of nature that is our joined ungainly desire? Remember, we answer once and for all. So I live um, out on 100 acres, 35 minutes from here, on the foothills. And much of my work uh, of late has thought about if things happen without you, you have nothing to do with them, and you have no responsibility for them, and you don't think about them. If, for example, an eagle uh, or a falcon or whatever comes and takes the bird off of the bird nest, whether I saw it or not, it have nothing to do with me. But when creatures somehow catch my attention, then is it my job to say, drop it? You know, like, so this is a version of that. Um, it's called on making a difference. And I am gonna for one second see what happens if I do this. Oh, a lot happens. Okay, this is great. Stay here. Stay there. On making a difference. For weeks, the cardinal darts among the barbed leaves of the holly, then undulates to the wire. Chit, chit, where the perch where it perches until you go. You gather she's woven a nest, but only see it the night your cat flings itself into the bush, toppling a coarse twining of needles and twigs. You scream at the cat. Toss a plastic pot to startle her. You'd been kneeling, planting, 
and stand too fast, your knees almost buckling. You race lightheaded across the lawn and reach your gloved, ungainly hand to lift two things that look no more like birds than human embryos. Their closed eyes, a bulge of darker pink on paler pink, sightless as the orioles on your breast. Their beaks gape round and impossibly wide as you attempt to orient them, fragile within the fragile nest. You wedge higher inside the holly, lacerating your skin as you brace it with the limbs the cats leap, snapped. You step away, hoping the hatchlings can signal the mother and father that's not sentimental who watch chit, chit, from a distance, as does the cat. Get, get the hell out! You have to believe the parents will hear them rustle. You sense their maws can do no more than swallow. You have to believe the cat suddenly won't hear. From now on, the cat stays indoors. That thought passes, as do the songs of birds, as do the images of other nests, seasons, acres of nests you never saw. Although the cat may have, and you, you could never have saved them all. It's hard to say if you've saved this one. It's worse, isn't it? That it's your cat and not an owl or snake that has, that will have, nothing to do with you. Chit, chit. The male and female call only to each other. Have they abandoned the hatchlings now that the cat has found them? Or now that you have? And then you reason the cat could have killed them instantly and would have had you not intervened. Now it's death by shock, starvation, cold, which must be worse than death by predator. You have no hand to hold the hand of fate. Finally, the female descends to a holly bough and disappears among the leaves. Chit. Your eyes follow the leaves that shift with her hops Imagining the story you cannot see. She's nowhere near where you've replaced the nest. Chit. The seconds between each call, chit, increase. And then she flies out, perching along the wire from where her mate has called nonstop. From what you think is a safe distance, you watch until there's only darkness to watch. The parents, the hatchlings, you all but your cat. The cat you took in how many years ago, dazed and starving behind the house in the middle of the nowhere you live, all but the cat give up. So uh, there's a thing they sold in the 50s to rural uh, properties called multiflora roses. <clears throat> yeah, and they're basically one of those very bad invasive species that now make brambles and, you know, cover the place. And then um, you might remember that pheromones are a chemical sense that creatures leave to affect the behavior of other creatures. So this is called On Living Fences, which was their nickname. You could, you know, 50 living fences for $7 or something like that. The deer wend their way amid the woods, plodding a narrow, single-file path among brambles, blockading trees, barbs of wire, blackberry, and wild rose. You take their lead, placing your inarticulate feet over the quotes their hooves have printed. 
prepared half moons some other earlier nation had scrawled to tell its travels to the future. With chainsaw, mower, and leather gloves, you clear a wider swath so you can walk erect and without ducking, without mangling yourself among the rampant multiflora roses that are no more native to this place than you, a virulent hybrid merchandised to farmers 70 years ago as living fences, feckless spires of predaceous thorns to keep the deer from their crops, the livestock from harm. But now they do not border your fallow acres. They are one and the same within, without, wanted, unwanted. The difference is lost or one. Mornings as you trace these paths you've added to your maintenance list. You place your waffled souls among the deer's notations. Fear, the fear moans of the dogs that always accompany you as if they served more than your childlessness. The practice rounds year round of neighbor's guns they haven't changed their common story a jot. Perhaps they know no other ending. Hapless as this sounds to you, some season far or not so far from now, not the deer can sense the difference. You could find yourself following their worn and silent example. When there is nowhere to escape, all the paths will lead there. And this, well, I started the timer, but now the timer is, oh, 10 minutes, okay. <clears throat> uh, this is called On a Redwood. One day when your friend delivers the pot-bound seedling, the redwood bought in college, shipped across the country and shuttled from porch to porch, spindly needles dropping like second hands, our clocks have all but given up. Plant it among your acres, imagining the day when it has grown the height of 30 men and shaded 30 generations. Of all the evidence remaining of how you live to make the world, of how you live to make the world more peaceable or just, consider this tree, one infinitesimal part of an earth that could by then be flooded, abandoned, or cold. So much of what we do will last a season. Our deeds our annuals we choose to sow again or not. So much of what we pledge extends for several years, no more, as if the heart as well rotates its yields. So much of what we dream bridges a generation, the 30 years or so before the child has heirs. So much of what we fear looks toward the century, the dimming likelihood that we will see such change. Time's rewards exceed our chance to ever accept them. You must consider now for all eternity. Actually, I think the stopwatch stopped, so. <laughs> I think that's my chance to say thank you very much and uh, an honor to read to you all tonight. I was going to have to move that lamp because I was really nervous. I was going to knock it over. No, that's me. Hi, y'all. Okay. 
So I'm going to read some poems from the new book. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I almost went to school here. <laughs> so it's nice I kind of get to do it all these years later. I'm much more together than I was <laughs> when I was trying to make that decision. So I don't know if I was wise or not, but this is called Weep Up. It's only technically morning. Not even the birds believe it. From her crib, my daughter tries to wake them, saying weep for wake. Weep up, birds. What else could silence mean to her but sleep? We might be the first awake on our street, the neighbors breathing still regular and slow, all the porches lit and moths losing their minds in that light. Rising, spellbound in the blurry dawn, I become my mother. 20th century sunrise was just like this, sad, soft focus ochre like an overexposed Polaroid. The sun is just now brimming over the golden edge of the lawn, and the dew begins to sizzle there. In the dark, I hear, weep up, weep up, birds, until they do. All right, so there are a few poems in this book that um, are sort of responses to questions that my daughter, who is now nine, asked me in the car when she was three or four years old. And I have this feeling that once kids hear those car locks automatically click, they know they have you. And there's no like, I'll get to that in a minute because you can't be busy doing something else. And so they choose that, um, that time where they literally have you as a captive audience to ask you big ex existential questions about the world that you can't avoid. So there are several in this book, and this is the first. Um, the poem is called Sky, and the question is, why is the sky so tall and over everything? <laughs> What you draw as a blue stripe high above a green stripe, white interrupted. The real sky starts at the tip of each blade of grass and goes up, up, as far as you can see. Our house stops at the roof, at the glitter black overlap of shingles where the sky presses down, bearing the weight of space, dark and sparkling on its back. Think of sky not as blue, not as over, but as the invisible surround, a soft suit you wear close to the skin. When you walk, the soles of your feet take turns on the ground, but the rest of you is in the sky, enveloped in sky. As you move through it, you make a tunnel in the precise size and shape of your body. That is not the answer I gave my child in the car. <laughs> Although I do believe if I answered her in sort of like sonnet-esque responses, she'd probably stop asking. <laughs> you know, it's like if you don't want to do something, just stop doing it well. Like if you load the dishwasher poorly, you won't be expected to do that anymore. <laughs> That's a tip. <laughs> this poem is called 20th Century. I must have missed the last train out of this gray city. I'm scrolling the radio through shh. The street lights fill with light right on time, but no one is pouring it in. 20th century, you're gone. You're tucked into a sleeping car rolling to God knows where, and I'm lonely for you. I know it's naive, but your horrors were far away, and I thought I could stand them. 20th century, we had a good life, more or less, didn't we? You made me. You wove the long braid down my back. You kissed me in the snowy street with everyone watching. You opened your mouth a little, and it scared me. 20th century, it's me. It's me. You said that to me once, as if I'd forgotten your face. You strung me out until trees seemed to breathe, expanding and contracting. You played American Girl and turned it up loud. You said I was untouchable. Do you remember the nights at Alum Creek, 
the lit windows painting yellow Rothkos on the water? Are they still there or did you take them with you? Say something, I'm here, waiting, scrolling the radio. On every frequency, someone hushes me. Is it you? 20th century, are you there? I thought you were a simpler time. I thought we'd live on a mountain together, drinking melted snow, carving hawk totems from downed pines. We'd never come back. 20th century, I was in so deep, I couldn't see an end to you. Yet here we are. This one's for Kathy. Bexley, um, the city of Bexley is the only city in the United States that is a designated arboretum. Um, and if you let a poet choose your neighborhood, she might choose a neighborhood where all the streets are lined with London planes. I mean, it also has a good school system, but if you let a poet choose your neighborhood, she's going for the trees. So this poem is called London Plain. The plane tree peels to yellowed newsprint, littering the yard with stiff sleeves of bark, collaged ivory and dove. A gray squirrel stands on its hind legs, gently combing clover with its paws, as if it were fur on the back of some animal it loves and tends to. Of everywhere I've lived, this is home, because my daughter draws it, periwinkle crayon for the peeling shake siding, black pluses for windows, a handful of pastels for the plane tree, pale and painterly. Every year it sheds its skin down to white bone. I pick up a mottled cuff and cut my wrist to show my daughter how to wear it. All right, this is Good Bones. Life is short, though I keep this from my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways, a thousand deliciously ill-advised ways I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there is a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake, life is short. And the world is at least half terrible. And for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you, though I keep this from my children. I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real shithole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. Two more? Are we okay? All right. You're in it for the long haul? There are brownies outside. I know you're thinking about those brownies. All right. I was talking a little bit about um, empathy with my students this week and how poems can be little machines that make empathy. And, um, and I think this may be the most empathetic poem in the book. It's called Panel Van. You know the one about the white panel van, the one about the dark sedan, the one I told my daughter this morning, the one about the man who's lost and needs directions, the one about the man who lost his puppy, the one that goes, come here, I'll show you a picture of my puppy, the one that goes, he's so cute, isn't he? Such a cute little lost puppy. I told my daughter the one about the not lost, not puppy. I redacted the part about what's lost, being something in the man, something he thinks a child can help him find, or maybe he thinks she has it, she doesn't have it. I didn't tell my daughter the man was once a child. He had a mother who zipped his tricky coat, tamed his cowlick with her spit-wet thumb, 
And how could she have known her son would search the web for cute puppy pictures, then roll past a park? This morning, I told my daughter the one about still loving the world we live in, the world the man lives in, lost. Yes, the same world. And this is the last poem in the book, which I think kind of goes with that one in a way. And it borrows um, a line that my daughter gave me when we were driving to pick up Indian takeout on New Year's Eve a few years ago. I joke that my kids live rent free. And so the least they can do is throw me a metaphor or an image now and then so that when they want name brand cereal, <laughs> I feel generous. Thank you for having me. This is called Rain New Year's Eve. The rain is a broken piano playing the same note over and over. My five-year-old said that. Already she knows loving the world means loving the wobbles you can't shim, the creeks you can't oil silent, the jerry-rigged parts MacGyvered with twine and chewing gum. Let me love the cold rains plinking. Let me love the world the way I love my young son, not only when he cups my face in his sticky hands, but when, roughhousing, he accidentally splits my lip. Let me love the world like a mother. Let me be tender when it lets me down. Let me listen to the rain's one note and hear a beginner song. Thanks so much. <laughs>